Hi, this is Mr. Gideon. Suffice it to say that uh, in many ways we just kind of scratch the surface when it comes to these economic theorists and their theories. Uh, you know, what we've talked about so far with regards to classical theorists and Keynesian theory um, is, is truly just scratching the surface. Uh, but if you were one of these economists and you're trying to make this case to the President of the United States, to Congress, whoever will listen to you, uh, summarizing it in the way that we just did isn't going to be persuasive enough. Uh, persuasive enough. So typically, what what these people have to do is use formulas, evidence, and uh, an extended argument to try to convince people about how this can actually take place. How, if wages and prices are flexible, the economy can fix itself. How, if we choose to focus on aggregate demand, there's a way for the government to get involved and to minimize the impact of the business cycle, particularly during downturns or recessions in an economy. So at this point, I do want to go into some more detail on the Keynesian side of the aisle, particularly with regards to the consumption function. But uh, Keynes is not going to get the last word. We're going to have quite a bit more f that we're going to hear from the, the classical theory side of the aisle. But what's the consumption function? The consumption function shows uh, in in equation format how an individual household's consumer spending varies with the household's current disposable income. Now think back to the expenditures approach to calculating GDP and how these four components C, I, G, and NX combine together give you aggregate demand. The C, of course, and you can probably visualize this if you think back to a circular flow diagram, is uh, spending by consumers or households. The capital I, the big I, is investment spending. That's done by businesses or firms. You have government in the middle of the circular flow, and then you also have net exports, exports minus imports, uh, but that includes spending by foreign countries on a country's uh, products and services. At this point, we're just going to focus on this piece, though, consumption by households. Because Keynes was particularly concerned with consumption, consumer spending, since it's by far the largest component of total spending. And consumption depends on disposable income. They're intertwined. So we use the consumption function to, to visualize this. And the consumption function is C equals C sub 0 plus MPC times y sub d. What does all this stuff mean? C is total consumption, so it's all of the C piece of aggregate demand. That one piece of expenditures using the expenditure approach. Remember there are other approaches to calculating GDP. We could do the income approach, which is really the, the, the mirror side, the opposite side, W plus P plus I plus R, but right now we're looking at the spending side. Uh, consumption equals what? Autonomous consumption plus the marginal propensity to consume times disposable income. C sub zero, autonomous consumption, is autonomous. It's separate. It's independent spending. It's consumption that is independent of disposable income. Autonomous consumption minus consumption uh, equals consumption when uh, you have certain needs that you're going to spend your money on regardless of how much income you have. Right? This is the kind of consumption you're going to do when your income is zero. Now you might ask yourself, how can a household consume when income is zero? Well, the theorists say they'll find a way. If it's something that's really crucial, you need to eat, you might need medicine to survive. Uh, basic human needs are going to be provided for through savings and borrowing in particular in this case. Okay, so this is truly need spending. But the other piece of the second half, the right, head, uh, the right side of the equation, let's take a look at that because that's where a lot of Keynesianism focuses. MPC stands for the marginal propensity to consume. It's a fraction, a decimal, somewhere between 0 and 1. If you're going to calculate the MPC by itself, then you use the change in consumption divided by the change in disposable income. Now what's disposable income? Disposable income is income that a household keeps after taxes are paid, as well as government transfers are received. If you think back to the circular flow, government transfers in this case would typically be payments to people that need help. 
uh, it could be social security, it could be welfare. Those are our examples of transfer payments. Y is used for income, not because we spell it Y-N-C-O-M-E, but because uh, the big I is already taken in economics for investment spending, spending by businesses. But what's the point of trying to visualize all of this? Well, consumption can be increased, of course, if you look at this formula, it's very basic algebra, can be increased by what? Increases in auto autonomous consumption. So, of course, if this piece increased, consumption would increase, assuming nothing else changed. If disposable income increased and nothing else changed, so would consumption. Or if the marginal propensity to consume increased, so would consumption. And if you got this piece to, to, to increase, for instance, this piece of aggregate demand in a recession, and nothing else changed, then, thanks to Keynesianism, our eyes become open to the fact that AD could shift to the right, and now we get back to long-run equilibrium. Obviously, the opposite could also be true. If consumption decreased, because one of these factors decreased and nothing else changed, and we happen to be in an inflationary gap, then AD could do the work for us. It would shift to the left and get us back to long-run equilibrium. Uh, perhaps this is this is going to be useful for you, but a way that I try to simplify the way that I visualize the consumption function is by saying, okay, well, the left side of the equation is consumer spending, which equals all of the needs spending plus the rate of wants spending times the money that people have for wants spending or saving. Keep in mind that even though it's not necessarily a uh, uh, prominent cultural characteristic for the average American. Uh, there are people out there in, in the United States that save. In other countries and different parts of the world, particularly depending on which continent you're at, uh, the priority for saving might be much higher compared to the way that it is here culturally in the United States. Uh, but you know, after you spend money on your absolute necessities, the leftover money that you have um, can be spent or saved. In our case, a lot of times we spend a lot more than other countries do. Um, but just think of it in those terms. Now, this line between needs spending and wants spending can be pretty blurry sometimes. I mean, if you think about basic human needs that we all have in a physical sense, the need for food, the need for shelter and clothing, all right? If you went with the most basic stuff to make sure that you weren't truly deprived, and that's what you spent your money on, it would fit under C sub-zero. But uh, sometimes, you know, when we spend money on food, shelter, and clothing, it's nice food. It's big shelter or big homes and expensive clothing. So, um, you know, the money that we would spend over and above trying to take care of our basic human needs would really fit more in the second part of the right side of the equation. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons we spend so much time on the consumption function, and you will have to do calculations where you're given certain pieces of the function and you have to solve for other parts. It's very basic algebra. Um, there's nothing more complicated than, than basic algebraic functions and algebraic operations in this class. That's as difficult as the math gets. Um, is the fact that um, when you think about the consumption function, there's something really powerful in there. It says, if you take a look at this, that perhaps the government can get involved in here to increase consumption, can't it? Because the definition of disposable income is the income people have after taxes. Well, who's in charge of setting what the tax rate is? The government. So, of course, it stands to reason the next step is that if the government's going to decrease taxes in a very simple sense, it should increase consumption. If the government increases taxes, then that would decrease consumption. So the government could have a crucial role in managing the economy and shifting the aggregate demand curve left and right. But not only that, the impact that it could have could be more than what it seems like on the surface. If the government's focusing on this piece, 
due to what Keynesianism brought us in terms of our awareness. They focus on disposable income. And let's say that we're, we're in a recession. Then according to Keynes, an increase in disposable income will act as a catalyst to additional consumption. It will lead to a ripple effect, a snowball effect, whatever metaphor you want to use. And the total spending will rise by more than whatever the government starts this chain reaction with. It's called the multiplier process. Now, this is not the only multiplier we're going to talk about in this class. Later on, we're going to talk about the money multiplier. That's in um, monetary policy. But right now, we're focusing on fiscal policy, what politicians have control over, particularly taxes and spending. And so, at this point, we're referencing this as the spending multiplier. But what's the formula for the multiplier? It's right here, 1 over 1 minus MPC. And uh, essentially, the spending multiplier, this whole concept is that you could have the government try to stimulate the economy, let's say, that happens to be in a recession or, God forbid, a, a depression, uh, by increasing its spending in some area. And that figure is just a starting point. So what's an example? An increase in government spending of, let's say, $100 billion. Say the government spends money on goods and services that are provided by Americans across the economy. Do those people take whatever portion of that $100 billion and just put it in their back pocket and say, thank you very much, and that's the end of the story? No. What they do is they decide what they're going to do with that. And, of course, for every dollar they get, they can either spend or save. They could spend all of it. They could save all of it. But chances are it's going to be a combination of both. Most people are going to spend most of that dollar and save whatever they can after the fact. But they take their portion of that $100 billion, and let's say I'm one of these people. They spend some money at my coffee shop, and I say, thank goodness. I really appreciate the fact that they bought this, and I take a portion of that, maybe put it in savings, but then I spend whatever I need uh, to spend the money on. If I spend it at the grocery store, then that business, that enterprise, benefits from the initial increase of $100 billion, at least my portion. And that enterprise will spend that money somewhere else. And so on, and so on, and so on. Now, MPC refers to our proclivity, our tendency to spend. Or more precisely, the marginal propensity to consume, the percentage of a dollar that we get in disposable income that we're going to spend. So if the MPC is, let's say, 80%, in other words, of every additional dollar of disposable income somebody gets in this country, on average, you're going to spend 80 cents of it. What kind of a multiplier effect would that have? You take this initial 100 billion but you multiply it by the multiplier, which is 1 over 1 minus MPC, using 0.80, this becomes 5. The total impact wouldn't be $100 billion. It would be $100 billion times the multiplier of 5, or $500 billion, a half a trillion. So this is what is so powerful with Keynesian economics. It says, look, in, in other kinds of fiscal and even monetary policy, uh, you don't always have a multiplier effect, in theory, that could be present. If the government increases spending by a trillion, depending on how ready the people of that economy are to spend that money, that new money that comes into their pockets, there could be a massive multiplier effect, well beyond what the government started. Now, as exciting as this sounds, let's take a look at some real data from a recent year in the United States, 2008. We're going to look at this distribution below. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average household's uh, autonomous consumer spending was about $17,484. What do you think the MPC was in the United States? You probably aren't too young to be able to think back and hear uh, to have heard that we once not so long ago had a negative savings rate. We have a strong, strong urge to spend. Of course, in the United States, uh, shopping is a hobby. 
maybe this is one of your hobbies. Not necessarily always a cultural norm in countries all across the globe. But here, shopping is a fun activity that people look forward to. So what do you think our MPC was for 2008, at least according to the BLS? Here's a plot of that, and yes, you guessed. The MPC was 0 0.534. A little lower than you might think, huh? Well, if you think back to 2008, we did have the financial crisis, which really spooked people and frankly has damaged our economy for the last few years. We're still trying to get through the wreckage of the financial crisis. Shortly before that, though, the MPC was much higher. Keep in mind, too, though, that um, you know people don't just spend every new dollar that they have as part of their disposable income over and above their autonomous consumption. People do save at different rates, but since households can only consume or save, saving is, of course, the difference between disposable income and consumption, and you're going to uh, be asked to do some calculations that don't just involve spending, the consumption function, the multiplier effect, but also calculating uh, savings rates. It's very simple though if you stop and think about this. If you have a dollar, you can either, as I said before, spend all of it, save all of it, or have some combination in between. If we're looking at this from a very simple algebraic perspective, the MPC plus the MPS must equal 1, the marginal propensity to consume plus the marginal propensity to save combined should equal 1. But back briefly to this multiplier idea because it's such a powerful idea and it's a major reason Keynesianism became so popular after World War II. Uh, there are some weaknesses in this, this concept because, of course, it is a concept, it is a theory, and theories don't always play out exactly as we expect them to in reality. The reality is that there's a couple of important points to remember about the multiplier, the spending multiplier in this case. One is that it takes many months to have an effect, and that idle resources must be available to be brought into production in order for increased spending to lead to more output, rather than just higher prices. Also, the multiplier doesn't address how real-world governments rarely impose lump sum taxes where the amount of a tax of, uh, of a household that, that the household is going to owe the government is independent of his income. Usually the amount of tax you owe depends on how much income you make. Uh, and that's not something that's reflected in the, uh, the multiplier or the consumption function. So uh, obviously you know what you're getting taxed influences how much disposable income you have and because this is an oversimplification, as theories normally are, uh, it's, it's almost um, implicit in that, that you have to assume that there's lump sum taxes for it to, to work out perfectly from a mathematical standpoint. Later, we'll, we'll talk about the reality when it comes to taxation and progressive, proportion, proportional, and regressive taxation. Also, you have to keep in mind that the higher the MPC is, the less disposable income leaks out into savings in each round of spending. But thanks to Keynesianism, I think um, you know the average person today knows a lot more intuitively, we might consider it common sense, about how the government can influence behavior in an economy. Let's say the, the government says, yeah, we're going to send people a stimulus check. We're going to increase our spending so that hopefully it leads to a, a snowball effect and it helps the economy. And it's kind of a funny commercial, or excuse me, a cartoon here where they say, yeah, what are you going to do with your stimulus check? Are you going to stock up on rice? Are you going to bury it in the backyard? Are you going to buy some gas? You know, try to beautify your house? Or, hey, what are you, nuts? This is America we're talking about. I'm going to save it which, ironically, is not really the American way. But the influence of Keynesianism was dramatic. And you can see, just with this visualization, uh, how Keynesianism took hold in the United States and uh, we decided, as a country, to dramatically increase our government spending, which led to a budget deficit at that time, but also 
increase, uh, excuse me, decrease the unemployment rate. Does this stabilization policy work though? If you visualize uh, visualize an economy from the point of an aggregate supply and demand graph. Well, here are some real statistics from the uh, CBO and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. If you take a look at the purple shaded regions, these are periods in which uh, our output fell below potential output. Green shaded, shaded areas are periods in which uh, it exceeded potential output. And it looks, according to these figures at least, and these go from 1989 to very recently, that we may have been in long-run equilibrium. In 1990, 1996, 2001, 2006, we were in gaps for four to five year spans rather than the decade or more that most macroeconomists would expect without stabilization policies. So this visual seems to indicate that, yeah, stabilization policies, thanks in major part to, to the ideas that Keynes advanced, uh, are useful. This illustration seems to support the notion that, that uh, there have been clear reductions in the size of economic fluctuations since World War II. It looks uh, on the surface of this that uh, we definitely had more dramatic swings in the unemployment rate until shortly after the Great Depression and Keynesian economic theory really took hold. And of course, with uh, President Obama coming into office and people having a negative taste in their mouth as a result of the financial crisis and the bailouts and, and having to put so much money into stimulus, um, you may have seen this sign <laughs> driving around somewhere in the United States that um, is a symbol today of the influence of Keynesian economics.